Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. So first up today, I want to talk about Gary Black and how he's been telling us what Wall Street has been thinking regarding the pricing of the Cybertruck. He said many on Wall Street were hoping Cybertruck would be more priced in the mainstream like the Model Y. Pricing it lower gets more volume up front. Let me stop right here and just say I don't have any idea why they're making this argument. Tesla already has all of the volume that it can possibly handle for the foreseeable future. Pricing it lower would not do anything except extend the wait time for these customers waiting for the vehicle. Simply put, Tesla pricing the Cybertruck lower right now is not at all going to speed up production in the short term. And I agree that many people are going to wait to buy the Cybertruck, whether it's because of the price or because it just makes sense to let Tesla work out some of the early production challenges. Again, for the foreseeable future, it doesn't really matter because Tesla has plenty of people willing to pay the higher prices as Tesla ramps the production. For two years now, Wall Street has given Tesla a hard time every time it cuts prices on its vehicles, even though that's actually in line with its mission and it drives further adoption. As we head toward autonomy, all of those things we've already talked about, now Tesla actually sets higher pricing and Wall Street says, actually, you know what? We want lower pricing. Just wanted to say this argument from Wall Street, not really coming from Gary Black, is totally baffling to me, seemingly fails to understand economics 101. We've been getting some really interesting detail about the Cybertruck over the weekend as conversations with engineers come out and the embargo has been lifted for certain interviews and creators that have had the truck now, some for a few days. I don't know who has already seen what over the weekend, so I'm just going to zip through some of these different videos and interviews, play some clips to give you an idea of what they're talking about, some parts that I found interesting, then the links for everything will be below so you can watch at your leisure. Um, that is why there are no clutch, clutch disconnects on any Cybertruck. It is because there's an induction motor on the front, a permanent magnet on the rear. It's the correct drivetrain choice. It's how I would do it. And um, it means that this thing is going to feel supernatural. Um, it's going to give you the power on the rear axle that you want. The front is there for assistance. And that's none of this is even the best part about the dual motor all-wheel drive. The dual motor all wheel drive Cybertruck may be the best one off road, just a prediction, because it comes with a front and rear mechanical differential lock. This is what Drew confirmed to me on Twitter. This has a diff locker for the front and rear. Now, for those of you who don't understand what a diff lock is or what it does, um, essentially you when you have an open differential, in a system and there's a ton of great videos on youtube that can visualize this as you apply power to that differential it's going to assuming all wheels have equal grip it's going to basically power both of those wheels through an open differential and it allows you to turn and maneuver the vehicle uh, and have different wheel speeds uh you know cross car left and right when you have a differential that is locked and connected, what it means is that both wheels have to turn at the exact same speed. That's not very practical for driving around parking lots or corners, but it is extremely practical when off-roading. See, the thing is, mm. with an open differential, uh, the power is going to go to the wheel that's easiest to spin. If one gets locked up, well, it still has a way to transfer the power out, and so the wheel without traction is just going to spin to a million and there's no way to get the traction over to that wheel that you really need it to so you can get up and over an obstacle. So what's cool is the dual motor truck, after this explanation, has two diff lockers, front and rear. Um, the, hum the F-150 Lightning only has a rear diff lock, as an example, and the Rivian dual motor system has zero diff locks. So that's the dual motor, and that's why I'm so excited about it, and that's why I think it's actually going to be awesome off-road assuming it gets the same suspension as the cyber beast so into that rear permanent magnet front induction system this is the correct choice tesla's drivetrain has always been top notch great quality and and here they're just proving okay at least it seems like it's set up for success and uh, what tesla does is they actually turned their wheel slip configuration uh, or i should say uh, control their their lateral acceleration wheel slip control in the motor itself so there's no lag time it's instant and that means that the launch performance of the plaid is incredible over time like it's incredible these little engineering things that they are doing to push the industry forwards 
And so in-motor traction control just means unbelievable wheel slip control. Jason Camisa, the very popular auto journalist from Haggerty, was on the Carmudgeon Show and did an awesome interview. There was some profanity in it, just if you're going to watch with kids, but really interesting insight into the Cybertruck as he had it for a few days. More importantly, Tesla basically told him anything he wanted to know. Let me get back to let me get back to how it outperforms everything in every way by starting to talk about what it is structurally. And the second step is now a totally different modular um, wiring network. So the fastest cans in cars right now apparently run at 500 megabit. Um, Tesla designed a gigabit can for the car, so it's order of magnitude. Uh, faster, huge increase in can speed, um, and then decided to stop. Control area network. This is the car's yes. computer system. Yeah, the, all of the computers that run everything. But rather than having wires go from one place across the car to the other one, they just decided they would have, I think it's a total of five or six modules um, that talk to the everything that's closest. But because everything can run over can, for example, imagine, think about this, but the best way to think about it is a stereo. You have a stereo, you have a head unit up front, and you have speakers, like 21 speakers all around the cars. Well, in typically, and the way a car would work is that you would have to have a wire that would go from the head unit to the amplifier, and then to a, a separate wire that would go to each one of those speakers. Well, if everything's run over the can, you don't. You just have a power support, a support and a can wire to everything in the car. So power supply, can. Like you've seen car wiring harnesses that yes, are yes. like an inch thick and it's like 200 wires and they're all wrapped around and each one of them could break and there's a problem with them and then it would pop a fuse or whatever. Replaced with this little tiny ribbon <laughs> and they reduced cross, I think the, the number was 77%, reduced the number of cross car cabling by 70 something percent and reduced the total number of copper by over half. So now that speaker just listens to the can and says, okay, this is what I need to be playing. That one does that. Oh, the door lock needs to talk to the window switch activator, which needs to talk to whatever. They just do it all over the can, which is genius. The traditional automakers are like a decade behind still. And we behind thought- those. Behind those cars, yes. like Model 3, Model Y, at least a decade, if not more. And we're like, okay, well, they're, they're, the ground is gaining slowly. And they he just walloped the entire industry with a passive aggressive PDF, say how to develop a 48 volt vehicle. And apparently here is that manual from Tesla for the rest of the industry, including suppliers that was shown in the Haggerty Cybertruck review, how to design a 48 volt vehicle, XOXO Elon. I'll let you zoom in to read that part if you want. Then he said, do we really have to do your homework for you? What went into this is like, I, I would, hang myself if I worked for a traditional car company right now. I, out, of, <laughs> out of sheer embarrassment. Like when they start pulling this thing apart, their mind is gonna be blown to the point of like, why do we even come to work every day? I think you get the gist. Jason was clearly very impressed with the engineering and the thought that went into the Cybertruck and there's still more to come once someone like Monroe gets their hands on the vehicle and the teardown begins. As mentioned, don't forget to watch the views and the comments, the general interest that the Cybertruck is creating. Here's a very quick one from MKBHD that I thought was somewhat funny. How does it spray the windshield cleaner? Okay. <laughs> excellent, excellent question. It's crazy. Great question. This giant windshield wiper is also hollow enough on the inside that oh, no way, no yes. way. No there way. is a pump underneath it that when you first press the button to like spray your windshield it takes a beat to pump the entire thing full of windshield wiper cleaner and then it sends the windshield down and then there's like 10 holes on the wiper blade that all spray <laughs> as it goes back to the top. Franz and Lars did a quick interview with Top Gear. I don't wanna play this one due to copyright purposes, but they did mention a new technique that they had to create that they're calling air bending. Fault Bugs on X shared this image saying, maybe better named high pressure air punching. Lars then responded saying, that's where we started. Unfortunately, the lower tool still makes marks until we added bearings and allowed it to float freely good sleuthing. Hopefully in the future, Tesla releases an educational video talking about this in more depth. On moving the low voltage or the non-drivetrain part of the Cybertruck to 48 volts, Holmar shared a screenshot of a text of someone saying, some people think Cybertruck has no 12 volt parts. It most certainly does have 12 volt parts, 
48 volts is really only necessary for things that were needing a lot of power. It's able to be unlocked and powered in a reduced power mode with just a 12 volt maintainer. The question becomes, is this for supply chain purposes? Is it for efficiency purposes? Back to why I keep saying that once Monroe gets their hands on this vehicle, they should have a field day. Speaking of, Monroe Live on X posted this video of Sandy sitting with Elon, so hopefully in the days ahead we get a full interview. My fingers are crossed that it will be technical in nature. Not over most of our heads technical, but just beyond some of the typical styling conversations we've heard ad nauseum for years. I've also seen a lot of people out there saying, well, other people are already using 48 volts in vehicles, but as far as I can tell, those systems are just for a hybrid powertrain system, not to actually power the vehicle computer or any of the electronics. All of the full videos will be below if you have the time. I'd encourage you to check them out. They're just full of so many interesting nuggets when it comes comes to the engineering behind the Cybertruck that really does indeed make it next level. Much more we'll hear about in the weeks to come. Canaccord Genuity put out a Tesla stock note talking about Cybertruck. They said one third of their survey respondents said they would buy a Cybertruck. They said it's a higher positivity rate than they expected. This survey had the strongest response of any to date. I've been covering Tesla fairly in depth for about three years now, but I've actually been plugged into the health, wellness, and fitness space for even longer. One day I'll have an avenue to share more publicly, but for now, I do want to highlight one problem that plagues our society, nutrient deficiencies. According to a 2022 study, they make the body unable to normally perform its functions, leading to an increased risk of things like cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Then add in micronutrient deficiencies, things like iron, zinc, vitamin A, and these can lead to intellectual impairment and degenerative diseases, as well as higher mortality. AG1, the sponsor of this video, is a quick and easy way to do what we can to combat this problem by getting 75 vitamins, minerals, and probiotics with every serving. I like to drop in a bit of their vitamin D3 K2 as well, especially during those winter months where I live. AG1 can of course support your immune system, your cognitive function, your energy levels, your hair, skin, and nails, but don't ever forget about the regular bodily functions we all take for granted moment by moment that are sustaining our lives. If you want to check it out and support the channel, you can get five travel packs and a one-year supply of vitamin D3 K2 for free at drinkag1.com slash electrified linked below. As always, thank you for considering supporting the channel. Of course, the skeptics and Tesla Q are moving the goalposts per the usual. Now they're talking about, well, can the Cybertruck do real work and all of those arguments. I just want to put it out there. Axios did a study on F-150 owners over a decade and only 7% said they frequently tow with their trucks. 29% said occasionally, and 63% said rarely or never. Morgan Stanley is expecting 30,000 Cybertruck deliveries in 2024, and then 78,000 in 2025. Then, how about this? They said, we expect Cybertruck will be supplemented by a range of Rivian-looking pickups and SUVs in the latter part of the decade, with a design language more consistent with prevailing Teslas. We don't need to spend time here. I'll just leave it at we'll see. I would say to periodically check the Cybertruck accessory page on the website if you're interested. It seems like they are adding more and more by the day. Right now, I'm counting 27 different Cybertruck accessory products available for sale or coming early 2024. I did want to touch on this. There were some threats made about the Cybertruck delivery event coming from one individual who has been arrested and remains in jail in an Instagram chat. Tesla was notified on November 10th about this group chat, and then the sheriff's office began investigating the threats on November 28th after they were notified no formal police report had been filed. Thankfully, this individual was stopped as he did make the drive from Florida to Austin to potentially carry out this attack. A few of you asked me about this. I don't have any special insight into what Tesla did or did not do when they were notified about this in the first place. Clearly, this individual is dealing with some mental health issues, and this is really all we know for now. Exciting news for you Australians. The first V4 supercharging location has been installed in Albury. This is a 16 stall site that should be up and running as soon as next week. 
Surprisingly, there's still no word on when Tesla is going to upgrade the cabinets that are behind these dispensers to actually enable up to that 350 kilowatt charging. Amidst all of the Cybertruck hoopla over the weekend, we missed some pretty big news when it comes to the Tesla Mega Pack. This from the SEC in Australia, not the SEC you're thinking of, but the State Electricity Commission. They're investing in one of the world's biggest battery projects, the Melbourne Renewable Energy Hub. Once complete, this hub will deliver 1.6 gigawatt hours of energy storage with the potential to expand. Tesla will supply the batteries and Samsung will supply the remaining components. Construction of the facility is now underway and completion is expected late 2025. As Drew Baglino highlighted, the Pioneer investment forms part of our, the SEC's, strategy to invest an initial $1 billion towards building 4.5 gigawatts of new power through renewable energy and storage projects. Some quick math, 1.6 gigawatt hours is equivalent to 1,600 megawatt hours divided by roughly four megawatt hours per Tesla Megapack. That's 400 Megapacks potentially in this project times $2 million a pop roughly $800 million in potential revenue for Tesla. On Friday, finally, the Department of Energy put out their proposed guidance on how they're going to classify and define foreign entities of concern. The latest on Tesla's website, they're saying the $7,500 tax credit will reduce to $3,750 for the Model 3 rear wheel drive and the Model 3 long range on January 1st, 2024. This certainly could be employed to encourage more deliveries in quarter four of this year, as there's still some uncertainty because we just talked about last week, the government is still considering pushing back some of these requirements that are set to go into effect January of next year. Before we get into how these FEOCs will be defined, there will be a 30-day public comment period that'll start upon publication in the Federal Register. Reading through this very wordy official document that I'll have below if you're interested, the number to remember to start is going to be 25%. Any company with 25% or greater ownership by the Chinese government or by current or former senior Chinese government officials. One of the biggest takeaways and areas of focus of the document without saying it explicitly is how this Ford licensing deal with CATL is actually going to work. Simply put, Ford is going to have to prove that it really is a true licensing deal and not actually a joint partnership. Ford will have to show that CATL has no control over the production and Ford will have complete access to plant data showing how the Chinese company's tech is operating. Then starting in 2025, Ford would also have to obtain the battery materials, the lithium, iron, and phosphate from either the US or a country with which the US has a free trade agreement. I'll tell you right now, this is going to have big implications for Tesla because Tesla is, I think, one of CATL's biggest customers specifically when it comes to LFP cells that Tesla is using increasingly across its lineup. My point is if the Ford and CATL licensing deal goes through and allows Ford to get the IRA credits, then that's going to pave the way for Tesla and other companies to do something very similar. And no, I'm not just spitballing here. You may remember earlier this year, we talked about Tesla planning something very similar with CATL with Tesla looking to build a battery plant in the United States. They even said at the time it was going to be similar to the one that Ford was working on with CATO. Once the automakers figure out how these requirements are going to impact them, we'll actually find out more of what vehicles will or won't qualify. So far, Ford has already said the Mustang Mach-E will no longer be eligible for the credits. In an email, Ford did however say that the F-150 Lightning built in Michigan will continue to qualify for the full 70 $500 credit. It boils down to what entity is actually going to be calling the shots and running the factory. Ford would have to be in charge of the show, its own workers had to be running the machinery, answerable to no one, and they had to have full access to the know-how behind the machines. The deal had to be a true licensing arrangement, not a joint venture masquerading as one. Where this leaves us for now is that Ford is going to have to submit their licensing contract to the DOE, and then DOE lawyers will have to verify compliance with the issues of control. I know this is not the most entertaining of subjects, but I'm telling you when it comes to EVs, the price of batteries for consumers, the supply of LFP cells that Tesla can have access to domestically with reduced freight costs, it's just going to have a significant impact when it comes to the overall cost of electric vehicles and the margins on Tesla's side and everything in between. 
We got the wholesale sales figure, which is both exports and retail for November for Giga Shanghai, coming in at 82,432. There are plenty of misleading headlines how it's down so much compared to November of last year, which by the way, was an all time high and was before Tesla really started to unwind the delivery wave. During this time period, year over year comparisons are not that valuable. It would be better to zoom out and look at the quarter as a whole. If Tesla could do around 93,000 units for the month of December when it comes to wholesale, both domestic and exports, that would be a new quarterly record. We'll get the rest of the breakdown in the next week or so. We have Detroit proudly touting one of the first wireless EV charging roads. There are charging coils connected to the power grid that emit energy to a receiver plate installed under these vehicles, then the energy passes through the battery. This is done in partnership with a company called Electrion, and this so far is a quarter mile of road. The word is that one mile of road would cost $6 million. So this quarter mile, roughly a cool $1.5 million. Electrion did however say this technology is safe and it only activates when a car with a receiver passes over the coil, ensuring that the energy is only transferred to a vehicle that requires it. Testing of the wireless charging tech will begin in 2024 with a Ford e-Transit electric commercial van. Listen, I'm all for sustainable technology, but when it comes to this one, color me highly skeptical. I'm still not convinced that just more public charging is not the answer when combined with the ability to charge at home. This week, the House of Representatives is set to vote on the CARS Act that would prohibit any future EV mandates. This legislation would also look to get rid of the banning of ICE sales in the future. If it does pass the House, after that, it would then have to pass the Senate. It looks like Tesla insurance must face a prospective class action claiming it overcharged drivers for their premiums by basing them on false crash warnings instead of actual driving behavior. On Friday, the court denied Tesla Insurance Services bid to dismiss the protection lawsuit. As we've all seen, some Tesla customers have reported suffering sporadic and random forward collision warnings when there is no danger in sight. And it's these false warnings that were leading to people paying higher insurance premiums. The complaint is seeking restitution, disgorgement of profits, and an injunction against alleged false advertising. A court filing did say though, an injunction here would simply require the defendant, Tesla, to make sure its advertising is accurate and to take steps to make sure that it doesn't factor in driving events that never happened. Honestly, that's absolutely reasonable. An initial hearing in the case is scheduled for January. As Sawyer pointed out, the United States just passed 1 million full battery electric vehicles sold in one year for the first time ever. On that note, don't forget, check out AG1 links below. Grab those freebies if you're interested. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video. If you did, you can find me on X linked below. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.